so uh, this one, session four, is titled Colors and Noise, the Spectrograph and the Signal Generator. This is kind of a fun one. Not a lot of PowerPoint here. Congratulations. Um, so it, again, same presenter. I'm Jamie Anderson, uh, Director of Training at Rational Acoustics. We're assisted by Chris Tanjoris, Michael Lawrence in the booth. Here's the thing. Um, a little error message came up the last time I was doing this, and it said, replace operator, press any key. And so what we've done is now Michael is running the, the shots and, and stuff. So I hopefully here I, I can't mess it up. There you go. Okay. And so, and then Gavin is here as well. Um, again, the, no, the email address you want to know is support at rationalacoustics.com. That will get us all. If you have a question, that's going to get it answered. If you have a problem, licensing problem, support at rationalacoustics.com. What are we covering today? Well, in this session, um, we're going to talk about the spectrograph. Uh, just it's a new view or a different view of the spectrum data, but it's pretty cool. It also makes you look like a mad scientist. It's a really cool view of it. We're going to talk about the controls for it, the dynamic range and slice height, um, the options for it. We're going to I'm going to do some applications, some, and hopefully I'm going to give you some files that you can you can try these at home, um, and the, of course. I just put this up front. You can't save the spectrograph. That's one of the questions. We save RTA data, but you cannot save spectrograph. And uh, this one is for our, our, our friend Chuck McGregor. Um, yes, we know it's called a spectrogram. A spectrograph is the thing that you create a spectrogram with. The spectrogram is the display. Um, <laughs> this was pointed out to us all the time. Uh, we still call it spectrograph. Uh, you can call it what you want. Um, the uh, And we're going to talk about the smart signal generator. We're going to talk about you know, a few things about it. A note about courtesy and safety. This is just, here's the thing. Um, the signal generator making noise, that's one of the only places where we can really hurt somebody or at least startle somebody. And so when you make going to make noise, one, don't just turn your noise on at a random level and then adjust the level. Bring your noise up to the level. Bring it in low and bring it up high and, and just notify everybody. One of the things, you don't have to use smart signal generator. You can use external noise source. One of the keys about your noise source, though, is being able to turn it off, being able to mute it quickly. That's that's just a safety thing and a courtesy thing. But um, I like being able to use the generator in smart a lot because I can just lean over, hit the G button, silence the generator. Um, so we're going to talk about the signals in there. Um, we're going to talk about referencing to gen and don't do it. And we'll talk about the geekiest thing you'll see in this class. Um, one thing I want to point out here, just figured I'd point this out, is that we've got a user manual. And the user manual has lots of really good information on the, the, the single channel measurements, on spectro, spectrograph measurements, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, use that source, RTFM, which is read the uh, manual, whatever. Your favorite manual is, I think, what it, what it is. Um, OK, so a lot of this is going to be on I'll get back to that slide in just a second. But a lot of this is going to take place on the interface right now. So we're just going to jump over to Smart. We have the, the five signals that we kind of configured last time. Um, the first thing I'm always going to do when I'm setting up for Smart is I'm going to go in and I'm going to go look at all my spectrums coming in and just verify my signals, make sure the signals are what I expected them to be. Um, this view, this is the zero view, the multi-spectrum view. And so that view of the, the signals just tells me I've got all my mics. Um, we're really going to be using only two signals here. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the mic one signal. I'm going to talk, turn off the DSP out. I'm going to turn off the mix out. Uh, for now, we actually will use that in just a little while. But I'm just going to look at these two these two signals. And so we've got the microphone, um, the, my Vox microphone, and we'll be looking at the generator. The cool thing about it is these two um, these two subjects go kind of well together. Um, and so we're going to start off. We'll we'll start off talking about the spectrograph, um, and then we're going to talk about the generator, and then we'll come back to the spectrograph for the geeky denouement or uh, end of, I don't think it's a denouement, but that's the, because it's not going to be, it might be, 
I don't know. You, you decide at the end. Um, and then we'll take your questions where we have time. Generally, when I cover this in class, it takes about an hour's worth of time. I'm trying to shorten these things up. I'm trying to compact them. Um, one of the things I did realize is that I start talking faster and faster. And I think that's because I'm not looking at people when I'm talking. The Joshua is not giving me this fantastic feedback of I'm going too fast. Um, so I'm going to try and slow my pacing down a little bit for you. We'll give that a shot. Okay, so um, right now we're looking at the, the spectrum of the, the microphone and we're looking at the, sp and the spectrum of the generator, but I'm going to jump to a view. Um, and in this view, what I've got is I'm going to bring now with the spectrograph on top, that's the spectrograph of the, the uh, generator right now, which is pink noise. It's this constant noise. I'm going to switch over and I'm going to to the microphone and I'll go ahead and hide the, the generator right now. Okay, so what are we looking with the spectrograph? Well, the spectrograph is just the spectrum and it's just graphed over time. And so the horizontal axis is frequency. Um, the vertical axis is time. So it's just graphing the spectrum over time and then color is gonna represent level. So where the, you'll see on the left-hand side of the plot, you see these two handles. These are the dynamic range controls for the, for the spectrograph. And so where the signal level is below the lower handle, that shows up as black on the screen. Once it crosses that threshold, it goes to a indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And then when it crosses the top, it's gonna to be white. So color is gonna be level. And so what you're gonna see, What you see there is just the, the frequency content over time. It's the same information as down low, but it's kind of nice to be able to look at the plot of the signal over time. What's kind of interesting is we're kind of the weird ones that look at the histogram. We look at the bar view of the, the RTA where we're looking at, looking at those bouncing uh, bars right down there. Um, the spectrogram is much more common use for looking at the spectral content of signals. So what you're seeing here is the frequency content of my voice. You can see the lowest energy in my voice, the fundamentals are down around 160 or thereabouts in the first harmonic. And so you see the harmonic content of my voice. If I did something harmonic like, ah, okay, that, that's horrible, but you can see the kind of the harmonic structure of my voice. This is what people would use for like voice print analysis. Um, this is something that that um, when they're taking apart, they're trying to figure out if it's a person doing a voice print or something like that. All this is is taking the spectrum over time. Now, one of the most common uses for us for the spectrograph is hunting submarines. Actually. We're not hunting submarines, but they use this in naval warfare. You might have heard like talking in Tom Clancy movies or something where they're doing sub warfare and they're searching for submarines. What they're actually doing is they're towing a ray of microphones and this phased array of microphones, which is just a really directional microphone array. And what they're looking for is constant mechanical noise. So the, the thing is that a constant tone on a on a spectrograph shows up as a solid line. And so they're looking for lines on the plot. You know, lines on the plot correspond with an alpha class. Well, they, basically what they're doing is they're getting the mechanical signatures of different vessels and boats and stuff like that. So you have the organic sounds of whales talking and farting and dolphins chattering about. Um, but basically you can see that that constant tone in the background, you can see that stripping through. That's a, the, a constant tone. So we're not hunting for submarines, but that is a good indicator of what we are hunting for. And one of the classics is feedback. Um, and so we'll take a look at a channel or we look at the output of our, our system. We can look at that and look for a line striping its way around. So again, you can see that, that even though the, the tone is buried there, um, you can see that line stripping its way across. You might also use this for looking for fan noise or resonances or things like that. There's all sorts of different ways. It's just the spectrum 
It's just the spectrum data, but graphing it over time gives you kind of a cool ability to spot things. One of the, the classic uses that we use it for when we're, is for when we're ringing out a system. Like, just take the spectrograph and look at the output, your output bus, and then just take individual microphones and slowly bring them up until, woo, and they feed back, and then you can come over and find whatever frequency it was that chirped and drop a filter there. Now here's the thing about the spectrogram. Once, this, once the, it is rolled off the top of the screen, that data is not gone. If I click on the screen and hit the up arrow, I can scroll back through the, the spectrograph data. So Smart is keeping a buffer of that data. How big is that buffer? Well, I can go to the spectrum options. I'm getting there by clicking on the, the button that says spectrum here. I could also get there by going option spectrum. When we get down to the bottom, you'll see two things down here with the spectrograph settings. You'll see slice height. So that's how the, I'll show you varying that in just a second. And then the slices in history. So the default is set at a thousand. Um, I moved it to maximum, which is 2000. Now, if you assume that we're taking 24 measurements a second, that's basically smarts rate of running. So it's running a, a 24 measurements a second. That means that 240 slices, 240 measurements, would be 10 seconds. So 1,000 would be about 45 seconds worth of data. 2,000 would be about a minute and a half, minute and a half's worth of data. Um, okay. So the thing is that that um, I've got a few controls here for my spectrograph. I'm going to go to the number one view, which is just the spectrograph view, um, and so. I can change the dynamic range here. Now, being able to, to look at stuff is all in the spectrograph is all about setting that dynamic range. If I set the dynamic range too wide or too far out, you can't see the detail in it. So um, these don't have any specific preset uh, levels. These are something you're going to change as you need to to make things show up in the spectrograph. Um, and then the other thing, the other control we have is the slice height. Now the slice height might make it look like it's going faster, but all it's doing is it's going how many pixels high is each measurement. Right now it's at one. So this is the most compact the, the spectrograph can be, but I can, I can expand it out to you know six high. I'm just using the, the expand and contract vertical scale hotkeys, which is the minus and the plus. That works in, a, in an RTA plot as well. So if I go back to this plot, I click in this window. So remember, controlling Smart's all about focus. So I clicked in the lower plot. And so I told Smart, hey, I'm talking to that plot. Then I can compact or expand the vertical scale in that. And I can always click on the outside and get back to it. If I, in the upper window, and I'll just go back to one plot again on the spec graph. If I click in that window and I hit the scroll up, I can get back to real time by clicking on the border of the plot right there. And so I'm going to kind of expand them a little bit. Okay, so that's our friend, the spectrograph. We're going to come back to, to him um, in a little while. Um, but what I want to talk to you about, I mean, and we'll do, we'll do a couple measurement examples and some cool stuff. Um, but first, um, let's talk about our friend, our signal gener generator. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back over to this view with the spectrograph on top and the the uh, signal that I have the mic signal down below, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn him off. I'll turn on my generator. All right. So here's a here's an interesting thing. I turned off what was graphing at the top. You notice that it, it doesn't seem to be graphing anything. I'm just going to remind Smart. Hey, graph that. Um, so this is not that exciting. This is this is pink noise. Now we use pink noise a lot in our measurements. Not only it's a it's a good source for listening. If um, there's a lot of things you can do to with listening to pink noise. But the thing about pink noise is, and the, why, the reason why we like it is it has all the frequencies there, right? It has all the frequencies there. It sounds flat to us. Um, it's got a low crest factor, meaning that it's got a low peak to average ratio. So when we're exciting a system, we're not worrying about, uh, you know, uh, just uh, clipping our signals. It's a very easy signal to, to measure with. I know that I'm exciting all the frequencies. 
later next week, maybe later this week, we're going to be talking about doing system measurements. Um, the thing is, we can measure with whatever signals going through the system. We don't have to use pink noise. We can use music. However, um, I'm going to ask this question again next week, and that is, can we measure a subwoofer using flute music? So we can only measure at uh, where we've got signal going through the system. The cool thing about pink noise is it's got all the frequencies there. So when I'm going to open up our signal generator. Now, uh, just a little note. The signal generator, is, uh, the controls of it are on the control bar. It's off to the right. Um, right now, I have them set up with the large size. The, the thing is that you might end up needing more space on that bar. Right now, the, the resolution of my screen, I've got plenty of room for all my measurement engines. But you might get to a point where you need to, to save room over there. So I could go into the View menu and say, you know what? I'm going to come down the View menu to, it says, use Compact Signal Generator. And so it will use a single space instead of three spaces to take up the control of the, the signal generator. In that case, I need to click in the little window where it's showing the level. I can click in that window to open up the signal generator controls. I will go back with my view, though, and I will put the, the signal generator, the full-size signal generator back. OK, so I'm going to open up our signal generator here. Um, here, is, here is our pink noise. And I'll let you listen to that for just a second. Everybody loves pink noise. There's our pink noise. OK. Um, so. What we can see here is we've got two flavors of pink noise. We have random noise and pseudo-random noise. Um, so I'll give you a little listen to it really quickly. There's random noise. There's pseudo-random noise. Random noise, pseudo-random noise. OK, they sound pretty much the same because they have the same spectral density, the same crest factor. Not a, not a huge difference, but that's the random noise is truly a non-repeating waveform. It just it's always different moment to moment to moment. Um, whereas the pseudo-random noise is actually a loop source. It's you can see underneath it, it's got a cycle length. The cycle length here right now in the setting is at 512k. The 512k roughly figures out to be about a 10 second loop. So you don't really hear that loop. If I instead shorten that loop, I'll shorten that loop to something like a 16K, which is about a third of a second. And you can hear that. Or if you, you drop it even lower, if you're a gamer, you might have heard these names, heard these sounds before. But that's kind of <laughs> annoying. So in general, what we want is we'll use the longer loop length. Now, both of the, there is no benefit, put up an asterisk right there. There's no benefit to using the noise in smart versus the noise coming out of console, or if you have a noise stick or anything. One noise is just as good as the other noise, asterisk. There is a place that when we get into showing you the impulse response measurement, um, in that mode, there is one measurement where having the pseudo, using pseudo-random noise that is synced to the, the, your measurement side will have a benefit. But for what we're doing, for real-time mode, there is, there is no benefit to it. Well, there's no benefit in terms of one noise over the other, but the cool thing about the pseudo-random noise is we're actually generating it on the fly. So we don't have to just generate flat pink noise. We can do something, we can do speech weighted noise. So what you're seeing here is the spectral content is actually set to, it's a standard for, I believe it's that's the male noise, the, the spectral density of male voice. If you hear that, um, sounds something like that. The cool thing here though, is that we have the ability to band limit the noise. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit, I'll set in the band limit. In the band limit, I can type I can type exactly, oh, something something is getting into my noise. I'm, we've got a little bit of crosstalk, but we're just going to push through it. So the start frequency, I can type in 234 hertz. And I could put the top frequency in at 1,234 hertz. So I could dial in the exact bandwidth that I want. And you can hear that. It stopped being pissed off. I don't know why. 
I wish we could understand computers, but all we can do is worship them. Okay, so here's a, a cool application of the banded noise that uh, some friends use. Um, I'm going to type in, I'm going to go from 20 to 120. So now what I've done is I'm just exciting the from 20 cycles to 120. Why would I do this? Well, if I wanted to walk around and listen to my system, but I want to just listen to the low end of the system, say I've got flown subs and subs on the deck, and I just want to walk around and see how they're interacting in the space, I could just, now I could just send noise to the subs, but then I wouldn't be listening to the interaction of the mains and the subs. So instead, if I just send the noise, the, the noise down low, it gives me a chance to walk around and get an idea of, of coverage there. The cool thing here though is that I can decide what band of noise I want to be able to send. Um, and the really cool thing about it is that the way we're getting this noise is not by creating pink noise and then filtering out the top and the bottom. Um, the way that you normally get pink noise, if you've got a little pink noise generator, oftentimes what they're going to start off with is just background noise, Johnson noise, so it's basically white noise. So it's got equal energy per hertz, and then you put in filters to, to set that spectrum down to pink. We're not doing that. What we're doing is we're just saying in frequency domain, we're setting the frequency content that we want, and then we're running an IFT, an inverse transform, and creating the time domain file that we're playing out. So we're saying we just want to create flat noise from this frequency to that frequency. So we never even created those other frequencies. We didn't do it by filtering. We just never created those frequencies. It's kind of cool. Anyway, that's our friend, that's our friend Pink Noise. Um, again, we'll touch on it later or that in our user manual, there is mention of using synchronized noise when we're doing impulse responses. If you want to jump ahead, um, go ahead. Um, but there's, there's our choices for Pink Noise. Now, Pink Noise is a source that we use for all sorts of different things. It's a useful listening source as well. Um, okay, so for signals we have here, we've got pink noise. Now, here's a, we've, we've got the ability to do a, a sweep. A pink, a pink sweep, and you've probably heard these things before. And so that's just a sweep. We don't use that in the real-time mode in SMART. Um, it's not synchronized with our measurement, and you have to have your measurement set up specifically to capture the full sweep. Um, the only place we use this in SMART is we use it uh, for um, we use it in SMART for for an impulse response measurement. So the place where I tell you about using the sync the the sync noise with the impulse response. I'll also talk about using the sweep. So what we're looking at here then is we're looking at a sine wave. Okay, so I can generate whatever frequency I want. Now here's an interesting thing. Remember how I was telling you, when you square off a wave, so when you clip a wave, you're going to create high frequency harmonics. So here's, here's a little test. I'm putting in the sine wave, nice clean sine wave. You can see it up there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the output of the console right and I'm gonna to go to this view so in this view what I've got is on top I've got I've got the output of the console on the bottom what I've got is the signal generator but I'm gonna turn up the output of the console and let's see if we can see where we clip the outside output of the console it's pretty obvious when it happens oh, there it is so those harmonics just jump right up if I took this guy and I said spectrum and I went to the frequency scale and I went to linear and I hit apply and I do that again you'll notice that all the harmonics come up evenly spaced because they're linearly spaced but we're gonna go back to um, looking at this in the, the third octave Hit apply okay alright so there's our there's our sine wave the the other signal that we have there is our dual sign. Um, so I'll turn on the dual sign. Now in the case of the dual sign, um, let's look at the controls. So right now <laughs> I've, I had set it up. I'll show you that in just a second. So right here we've got our dual sign. Now I, I kind of use that sometimes. I, I will type this in. I sh you guys know where I'm going if you've been in my class. 
but I'm going to type in a thousand and five hundred. And so when you listen to that, it's an octave. And then I make a joke that I I sometimes will use this just to piss off musicians by detuning it like that. That's kind of horrific sounding though, so I apologize. Um, I I don't really use this signal generator um, for the dual sign source except to do this demo uh, when I'm in class. But here's a fun one. I know that you end up using uh, dual sign for looking at issues, say, of intermodulation. So what we're looking at here um, is that we're looking at the two s sine waves, 500 cycles and 501, um, and we can see them modulating each other. So they're, you're getting a one hertz beat frequency. So we can watch it here too. And if I bring this up, we could probably see it start to form a dotted line if I change the dynamic range. And it's kind of exciting, or maybe it's not. But that's the that's that signal, the the dual sign. Okay, which brings us to well, this is great. I've got this. I got this done. I'm going along. I've gotten this stuff done a lot quicker than I was hoping for. So we'll have a lot of time for questions. Um, but let's look at some let's look at some cool stuff. So the last signal that we have available for us here, and what I will do is I'm going to go ahead and turn off the mix output. So I hit OK, turn off the mix output. I'll turn for the signal. I'm going to go and choose to run a file. Okay. So in Smart, we have the ability with our generator to play. Um, any wave file as the output signal. Um, so let's say you wanted to play M noise. We do not have M noise, Myers M noise built into Smart, but they've published a wave file of it. So you can, in fact, uh, play, say, a, a file of, of M noise if you needed it. Um, here, I'm going to go in and browse, and I've got some signals set up for you guys. Um, and so um, this right here, what I want to show you was an application for our spectrograph. Um, and this is what we call the spinning spectrum. The spinning spectrograph is basically what we're going to do is we're going to put pink noise <coughs> through a speaker. Now we do this a lot of sound engineers is we'll put noise through a speaker and we'll go walk the pattern of the speaker to hear where we've got coverage, where we don't have coverage. In this case, instead of us walking around the speaker or walking around the speaker holding a microphone, what we're going to do is we're going to keep the microphone in a place. And what I have is a speaker here sitting on a little turntable and I'm going to turn the speaker. So with constant noise going through the speaker, I'm just going to spin the, the speaker with noise playing through it. And so what I did is I recorded that earlier today. I recorded uh, some pink noise um, and spinning this guy right here. And so I'll go ahead and I'll, ch I'll choose that as my source. And uh, say, come here, close. Um, grab the wrong guy. Bring him to the front. And I need to get rid of him. Bring him up. I'm going to hide him because why are you not going away. Hit cancel. There we go. See, even when we've got Michael doing the the board work, I can still screw this up. I tell you what, I screwed the, anybody that's been in class with me has seen me screw up everything, pretty much everything in Smart. Okay, so what we've got here um, in the generator, just a little note on the bottom. Um, here is the output of the device. So you choose you choose a device that one of the devices that Smart can see output devices. Those are my choices for output signals. And then you choose the output channels on that device. I'm using three and four on, on uh, the Dante virtual sound card. Here's the thing. It says main and auxiliary because this is not a stereo player. Um, when we play a file, we're only playing the left side of the file. So if you want to use smart to, to listen to music, 
what you're going to hear is just the left side of the file when you play that file. Um, we want just a single mono source. We don't want a stereo source for doing our measurements. Um, our intention, of course, is in the future when the roads are paved with cheese and we're all wearing unitards on starships, um, we'll, we're going to build in a, a stereo generator. But right now, the main output and the aux output are just two views of that same left signal. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to browse here and I'm going to take this guy, which was uh, spinning spectro and open him up and hit OK. And I'm going to generate the noise. And let's go ahead and make sure that he's now I'm not seeing anything up top, but you can see that my threshold isn't low enough yet. So and this is you can hear. So you could hear that speaker swinging by. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the threshold down here. Okay. And then I'm going to drop the other threshold here to give the set the dynamic range at about 6 dB worth of dynamic range. And then what I'll do is I'll go to a single a single view and I'll compress him down a little bit. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I want to take a look at this vector graph. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over and I'm going to pause my measurement. So I'm going to turn it off and then I'm going to unhide the data. And now I can kind of scroll around through here. So what are we looking at here? Well, what we're looking at here, horizontally, we're talking frequency. So we're sending in all frequencies pretty much equal level. All right. And then time represents where we are actually on the speaker. And then level, of course, is color. And so what we've done is basically a poor man's polar plot, a poor man's beam width plot. So we can see that up top, this horn has got really good directivity. It's giving us really good control. But when we get above, when we're above 1K, when we start to get below 1K, we start to hear, uh, we get less beam pattern control. We're probably crossing into the low elements in the, in the speaker. Down, by the time we get down to the bottom, it doesn't matter which way the speaker is pointed, you can hear it. You can hear it at pretty much equal level, no matter where you are, because the speaker, it, we just uh, we, that driver has basically no pattern control. It's pretty much omnidirectional when you get down low, um, but up top shows us a really cool pattern. Another source that I'll pull up. Um, what I'm going to do, if, you've, if you're listening to pink noise, if you get close to a boundary, you hear this sort of flanging sound. That flanging sound is because you've got the direct path and the bounce path coming in. But the bounce path is coming in at a, that time relative to the direct path is changing when you're moving your head around. And so you hear this sort of flanging sound. In fact, that term flanging comes from back in, in ancient days when rock and roll stars were recorded to vinyl and dinosaurs roamed the planet. Um, when, they, when they were doing record in the studio, for a delay effect, what they were doing is a tape loop delay. So it was going through a real to reel tape and feeding back in. And so if they took and put their thumb on the flange of the tape reel, they could slow it down and speed it up and create that wow, wow sound. One of the things you'll notice, the, another place where you'll hear that sound is if you're listening to speakers in a room with a really hard floor, um, I don't know how many of you guys have had to sit through speaker demos in a room with just this hard cement floor. As you walk towards the speaker, away from the speaker, you hear that wow, you hear that flanging sound as well. That what you're hearing, I th it was funny is that people call it phasing as well. Um, and it's what you're actually hearing is the peaks moving the magnitude, the peaks of the of the comb filter is going to be walking. So I, nobody ever calls it magnituding, but they, they just call it phasing because that sounds cooler. Um, but Anyway, what we're we'll take a look at here is I I just bounce a speaker off the wall and move my microphone through that that field, and so I'm going to go ahead and and um, pull up this guy and this is flangey, um, not your fingers but flangies. Um, so hit OK and I'll go ahead and make this measurement live and I'll click on the frame to get me back to the live measurement. And so you can hear this here.
and I'll change the dynamic range a little bit, really make those dips show up. And so you're seeing the, the troughs, what you're seeing is the troughs of the comb. So if we looked at it with the spectrum, it will be easier to see. And so you can see in the spectrum, you see those, those, the troughs of the comb. And I'll take this guy and I'll blow up his vertical scale so he really shows up. So that's what you're listening is you're listening to that comb filter move around. And it looks really cool on a, on a spectrograph. Um, so that's that's another thing that you will you you can use the spectrograph for. I mean, in a way, when you're walking around and you're hearing a change, right? You're saying, "I wish I could see what I'm hearing." Well, the measurement that best correlates with our hearing mechanism is the spectrum measurement, and all the spectrograph is is looking at the spectrum over time. And so people have come up with, I like, say, the infinite number of monkeys because there's a lot of stuff that we've done in Smart where um, we had a measurement. In fact, when we started with the spectrograph has been in smart ever since the beginning, but we had very, we didn't have a lot of things to do with this. We didn't really know what we were going to do with it. But as people started playing with it, they came up with some really cool techniques to use the spectrograph to find problems or see combs or, or what have you. And so, um, there's a lot of stuff that went into our building of our version seven and version eight spectrograph, like the ability to click on it and scroll back through the, through the data, the ability to change the dynamic range on the fly. Um, all of that is built out of people out in the field playing with this and saying, hey, it would be really cool if we could do this. Um, again, you have a great idea support at rationalacoustics.com. Make Chris have to write that down and put it on a list. Um, that's, uh, so, um, so I said what we we're gonna do is we were gonna go, I was gonna give you the geekiest thing that I'm gonna show you. Um, here's the thing. Um, I had two other things. One of the things is I use this view of the, of the spectrum almost more than I use the RTA view when it comes to listening. Um, because one of the things about it, what's really nice about it is that if you're listening to music, you can start to relate the spectrum that you're seeing, the spectrograph that you're seeing, and you can see it over time. You can kind of see a beat structure to the music, and it, it helps me find a problem. If I'm walking around and I'm hearing a problem, right, I can hear the problem, then being able to see what I'm listening to will help me track down what frequency range that's happening in. So it's a, as a listening tool, it's, it's a really cool view of what you're listening to. And what I would suggest to you is, is hook that up, hook it up to a microphone. Um, if you're a monitor engineer, well, one, don't be a monitor engineer. Friends don't let friends be monitor engineers. But if you're going to be, you're probably gonna want the each mix that you have to feed a spectrograph so you can see if you've got lines showing up, feedback lines and things like that. But um, the, the thing is that, that spend a little bit of time, just hook up, hook up some music and look at the, the spectrograph of the music. What I would suggest is probably not looking at the microphone because you're picking up what's going on in air, what the noise in the background. Look at the direct signal, um, but it's a very useful uh, listening exercise. It's kind of fun. Um, and so I would, I would highly suggest you set that up, but we, <laughs> I was going to show you some songs uh, that I th looked really cool in the spectrograph, but uh, Michael pointed out before um, before we started that I probably shouldn't play music that's copyrighted because then if on we're doing this on YouTube, uh, YouTube would flag it and and uh, not allow us to show this stuff. So I would say pick your own pick your own music. Spectrally sparse stuff is really fun um, to to see and listen to. Um, this is also, I mean, this is what they're using. They're making a spectral print of these songs. They're using that to spot us. This is, this is what that, this technology is, is for. There's also some great technology. Uh, Isotope, Isotope um, has some stuff that is um, when you're doing mastering and you're, doing, you're looking at noise in vocal tracks or in music tracks, um, it's a way of filtering out noise and cleaning up tracks and things like that. So there's some really great tools out there that use this technology. 
Um, but this is this is the spectrograph. It's just another view of the spectrum, and you can have you can have two uh, spectrographs running at a time. You can only have one in a in a plot, so you can't have multiple spectrographs in a plot. Hopefully, for obvious reasons, um, but you can have two plots. And yes, you can um, go to multi-spectrum view. It's really uh, time consuming to do this, but you could go to zero, the multi-spectrum view, and then you could come in and change each one of these plots to spectrograph. Um, so if you were into doing something like that, um, here you could do it. Um, one little note, uh, well, uh, I, this as soon as I, I go away from this and come back, it's going to go back to RTA. So if I go back to this view and then I go back to here, he's he's back to spectrograph. Um, but you you can do that. But mostly what you'll end up doing is this, where you're looking at two plots. I hit the number three view. Um, actually, the number two view is spectrograph over spectrograph. So we're looking at the vocal mic and uh, yeah, vox mic because I can tell what's in there and the, the live guy. So we'll come back over. And so I told you that we were going to, uh, we we're going to take you to the geekiest thing. So come back over and we'll look at this spectrum right here. And I'm going to play this signal. Um, so signal generator, browse. Um, so you already know what's coming. So we have this great sound. Now, this spectrograph doesn't, doesn't really make much sense until you go ahead and you look at it. On the spectrograph view. So there is a, we, we used a program out there. It was called Coagula. It actually, it's a PC, runs on a PC. Um, there are a few programs out there that will do this. But the, uh, the, what it does is it's just using FFTs. What it's doing is you feed it a picture, you feed it a photograph um, or a JPEG. And then it takes that and it says, okay, this, this is frequency going this way. It's time going this way. Actually, we'll turn it that way. Um, and then color is level, so it reads the picture. And then just like we were doing that banded pink noise, what it's doing is creating those, the, the wave signal. It's creating the time domain file that creates those frequencies at the time required to create that print. So it's kind of funky. Um, what I like about this is it's just using that power of the FFT. It's taking, I want these frequencies at this time. So you take from, you go from frequency domain, you run the inverse transform to create the time domain file. And then you get, you get this guy coming out. Okay. So what I will do now is we'll jump back over. And um, the one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and then we'll do questions, is... Um, Yes, it is possible in SMART to, instead of having to send the, sig the generator signal out and through the system and then bring it back into your device like we've done here. So you can see that the signal goes out into the system. We've looped it back here. We've also, we're also grabbing it when it comes out of the mix, the mix board. We'll talk about that later. Um, but here's the thing. We also can internally in SMART it's an expert user feature, but you can, in fact, internally in SMART, set your reference to your transfer function measurement to the generator internally. Don't do it, okay? The first problem with it is just that as soon as you start referencing internally to the generator, you've added the latency of whatever bus you're getting to your I.O. device with, and that, that could be significant. That, that could be, you know, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds just going one way, plus the latency of the, of the D to A and A to D converters when you come back in. So when you start taking delay measurements, you get not just the delay of the system that you're measuring, but also the delay of your measurement system. And so while it's constant, it just, it's, it's a call generator, as we say in, in the support department. But basically, 
when you take your measurement, while you're thinking you're going to take a measurement with 20 millisecond delay, it ends up being 78 milliseconds. Um, and so that's something, it is a useful thing to be able to do is to reference uh, internal uh, reference internally, but don't do it. It's just going to complicate matters. When you have to do it, give us a shout and we'll walk you through it. Um, the other thing about it though is the whole thing about the generator, when it's not making noise, it doesn't exist. And so you can't, as soon as you turn the generator off, the measurement turns off. It cannot, it cannot be running. And in fact, you can't start your measurement and then turn your generator on because the generator to the program doesn't exist. We, we are looking to fix that. We're looking to do all sorts of things um, in future versions to account for that latency. But right now, don't reference to gen. Make your life simple. Loop your signal back so that your reference signal in your transfer function measurement and your, your measurement signal both go through the same ADD converters. Make your life simple. So I think that's it for, for color and noise. Um, I, I, it's one of the coolest um, views of the signal. Um, it's If you want to, to just you know, do something for little kids, just give them a microphone and a speaker and then put the spectrograph there and so that they can talk through they can talk through the microphone and not only hear themselves through the speaker but but see the spectrum that's always a, a fun bit anyway um thanks i i'm really happy that i got this done in 45 minutes and you guys are probably happy as well um michael did we have any questions or we yes oh yes, okay we have a couple of questions um can you talk about what file types you can play with the signal generator and whether or not it will loop that file uh, wave. <laughs> um, a, uh, J Johnny, if Johnny's on the, some, if I, if I don't know, I always ask Johnny. Um, but I believe we can only play a wave file. Um, the, the second thing is that it automatically loops. So what happens is that when it gets to the end, you notice that when I did the, um, the, the flangey thing and the, that flange thing goes through two flanges and then it looped back and you saw it was just running continuously. So um, the, the wave file will just sit there and loop. Was that an answer? I think so. Uh, okay. And we have some time. Why don't we look at the uh, the peak feature on the, uh, the oh, RPA? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that was something I wasn't, I wasn't so sure I would have the time to do that, but this is, this is, just wanted to show you, uh, this is the type of stuff that it's, it's really worth your while to, to go in. Now, I'm going to take the generator, and while it's really nice that it's, it's calling our name over and over again, um, and I'll expand the dynamic range here. Um, so what we've got here with pink noise, um, we like pink noise because it has a, a low crest factor. What that we're talking about is peak to average ratio. So whereas with pink noise, that's like eight to 12 dB with, when we talk about voice and music, you're talking anywhere from 12 to 24 dB peak to average ratio. So it's a much higher dynamic range. So it makes it an easier signal to measure with. If you were using, um, and I'll just go to the full on spectrum view, which I hit the wrong key. I hit the S key, which the default spectrum view. Um, so the uh, the thing is that, that um, if you were measuring, let's say you're measuring with a wireless system or you're sending your measurement signal over a wireless system or something, there you're worried about dynamic range particularly, even if you've got the best wireless system around. This is great because it's got a, such a low crest factor. And so uh, what, one way of taking a look at that is I'll go to, um, actually what I'll do here is I'll go to this view of two spectrums here so you can see this. And what I'm gonna turn on and I tell you what, for my banding, I'm going to go to uh, 12th octave banding. The reason why I do this is it will be a little bit more visible on your screen. And I'll go to Spectrum Options. And right down here, we have peak holds. Um, and so I can turn on the peak holds. And right now, I'm going to have them be a timed peak hold. And I'll have them hold for, I don't know, three seconds for the moment and I'll hit apply. So notice nothing happened here until I hit apply. 
and now we have the peak holds coming out. So I hit OK. And so I'm sitting here talking, and you can see the, the peak holds. You can see the peak to average ratio. And so you can see, you can see um, you know, we've got the peak holds there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the peak holds to a, um, a infinite peak hold. I'll hit Apply. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit my spectrum. Um, and I'm going to average my spectrum, and I'll just do an infinite average on the spectrums. And so now we've got these two signals. I'm sitting here talking. I'm saying really intelligent things or, or something that can pass as an intelligent thing. And so I'm sitting here talking and blah, blah, 10 tiny turtles on the telephone talking with the grocery man. And so as we're doing, um, as we're looking at this, you can see the average, the peak, and the average ratio. And the the pink noise has a much lower crest factor than, say, the, the speech, where you've got a higher peak to average ratio. It's kind of like a, a poor man's crest factor measurement right there. But you can see the difference. Now, here's an important key just for averaging in general. V. V is in Victor is the hot key that flushes out the old data and gets you to a fresh new averager. So you're, aver you're, you're flushing out the averaging buffer um, reseeding the averaging buffer. These are all ways to say the same thing. That's a key that particularly when we get into transfer function, you're going to find that a very helpful thing because one of the great things, averaging really helps improve our measurement quality, our, um, our dynamic range, reject noise, does all sorts of stuff, but it decreases its reactiveness. In fact, my measurements now here have kind of really paused almost um, they are getting data in but but they've kind of they've kind of stopped right there um, so what you're going to find is that you kind of when you were doing transfer function measurements you want a high amount of averaging to get you your best data but you want it to react when when you change something so you can always use the v key so you can kind of have the best of both worlds where you're using a high amount of averaging but you can hit the V key whenever you want to see a, a change, once a, change, a system change has occurred. And OK, now I think that I'm, I think that I'm done, or is there anything else we want to talk about? I think we just want to clarify, there's a couple of questions in the chat about, you said don't use the internal signal generator as a reference. What you mean by that is don't reference it internally. Right. It okay. Versus a loop back. Can you just clarify I'll, that? Yeah, I'm going to show you that. Um, we're we're peeking ahead, but if I go to options, free transfer function options, there's a little option down here that says allow multi-device transfer function. Okay. So normally, when you set up, we set up a transfer function. We're going to get into. We're going to be grabbing a signal from two signals from the same device. The great thing about that is then you know it's got the same latency. A, there's um, you, they're on the same clock. It, all, it just makes the measurement so much simpler. But we can actually grab two signals from different devices. And this will also allow me, when I'm setting up my measurement, so if I hit apply right here, when I go to create a transfer function measurement, it comes up and it says, I can name the transfer function. Then it says, for a measurement signal, it gives me, I can choose a device and a signal. And my reference signal, I can choose a device and a signal. And what I can do is I hit cancel. If I go to config, IO config, there we go. Um, you can see that in the, in the menu, I can choose my generator as a source. So if I come back down here and I do that multi-device transfer function, one of the devices I could choose would be the actual generator, Smart's generator. So if you're using Smart's generator, um, sometimes we might have a, an I.O. device that might have two mic preamps. USB pre is a classic example of this, where you've got two mic preamps, and you'd like to do two different transfer functions using those microphones. And so wouldn't it be cool to be able to reference internally so that you can switch between those two microphones? Um, don't do this. Don't make your life more difficult than you need to do to do it. I'm going to hit cancel and I'm going to go back to options and I mean, uh, yeah, I'll go to options, transfer function options, and I'm going to uncheck that box. Um, again, um, please uh, don't, <laughs> don't make your life any harder than you need to. Um, you got to keep your brain sharp for making good decisions on good data. 
So we all we all good. I go back to my is it did that make it clear? Yeah, absolutely. And I a couple of folks asking, can they watch this again or where can they find the, the slides and all that stuff? No, you can you can folks. only you can only watch it once per customer. It's weird that you two guys will come find you. I hope you've taken very quick notes because <laughs> uh, it's all you get. <laughs> That's uh, the no, beauty of this. Rationalacoustics.com slash webinars, and you can find the links to view this session, all our past sessions. You will see all our future sessions. We're doing Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can also download the uh, lecture notes and the slides and all those materials as well. And, and if you have I any would, questions, of course, reach out to support at rationalacoustics.com. And I will, I will put some, uh, some of those files that I was showing you on the spectrograph for download as well. There we go. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Keep healthy. Thanks for showing up, guys.